And I mean, it treats the war as if, the mat as if what was going on in the war was that Americans were metaphysically evil. We are demons. Uh, and it would be great maybe, and maybe now would be the time to make a movie about what the war really was about, how we got into it, what happened. I mean, the same way instead of treating Hitler as a demon, it, it might be great to have a movie about what that was all about. But demonism comes so easily to, to movie thinkers. It's got all this wonderful melodrama. And, and it's understandable that people are fed up with seeing themselves as evil and rotten and guilty, and that they might want to move on to something else. What is terrible is that they simply react back to the days when the American Eagle was pure of heart and Robert Taylor was his name. Uh, now our only actor who is like that is, of course, Robert Redford, who saved us in both All the President's Men and Three Days of the Condor, and is saving us again, saving our souls in The Electric Horseman when he learns truth and beauty from a horse. Uh, I mean, it's interesting to see how liberals think. I mean, look at all the president's men. Here is this wonderful wasp, uh, and he's running around with this small, pushy Jew. Uh, the wasp keeps saying to the witnesses, you don't have to talk to us if you don't want to. The Jew tricks them and forces them to talk. <laughs> Now, I mean, that is Hollywood liberalism. <laughs> and people are so happy about the fact that, that Robert Redford is saving the country. I mean, he has an informer. Uh, and the, it's, I mean, he's lucky he's got an informer. It's no tribute to American journalism. Uh, and that informer is presented in some sort of idiot gothic way with green light on his face. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's a terrible guy because he's an informer, whereas the virtuous guy wouldn't even try to pry more out of him than he wanted to tell. Well, these are not very interesting attitudes. I mean, we should be going a little farther in dramatic writing. Yes? experience in Hollywood hold any surprises for you or change the way you looked at movies at all? Oh, it doesn't, my experience in Hollywood doesn't change the way I look at movies. I mean, what's on the screen is what you look at. I think I understand better now how they get to be as bad as they do get to be. <laughs> I understand a lot better now how certain people get to be in the position to run a studio. I understand how the different temperaments determine the, the decisions they make. I will tell you how they get to be head of the studio. The qualification is getting the job. And you get the job if you know how to provide reassurance to your superiors at every step of the way. If you never let your superiors know that you know more than they do, if indeed you do. And if you make them feel safe, if you are completely non-threatening, there are practically no heads of studios now who have any interest in movies at all. And they are open about admitting this. Some of them are brilliant bureaucrats. They know how to manipulate the talents of the other bureaucrats. They know how to market films. They know how to make deals with television. They know how to say, no, I might like to see that movie, but I can't sell it. They, they are very smart businessmen and they have no interest in movie making as such. They are interested not just in the deals, but in climbing to positions beyond the movie industry often. And they would feel very threatened by someone who really had imagination and who wanted to take risks. For example, the director Peter Yates spent between five and seven years getting financing for breaking away. If he had not made The Deep uh, a horrendously sleazy movie, he would probably never have had the opportunity to do it. That script passed from studio to studio. It was optioned all over the place. Everybody let it go. Now, that kind of man does not get a job as an executive, a man who's determined to get something done that way. 
So the war between the directors and the executives goes on. But now the executives simply have it better worked out in business terms. But also when you're there, you see why certain studios produce certain movies and others don't. And it's very often the kind of respectable taste of people who never went to the movies. For example, there's one studio head who says his favorite film is A Little Romance. That was the George, and he didn't even make it. It was made at a different studio, which lost its shirt on it. But it's an absolutely safe, sexless, sweet movie. A movie so bad, it defeated even Laurence Olivier, who gives, I think, the worst performance of his life in it. Uh, another actor uh, asked me one day, he was testing me, this was Michael Caine, he asked me what I thought of Olivier's performance in that movie, and I said I thought it was an atrocity. And he, he said, you know, Larry himself says, I went over the top on that one, didn't I? <laughs> Uh, but you know, the press went on saying it was a great performance because Laurence Olivier now is so, supposed to be a certifiable great actor. But that is the kind of picture that, say, a financial wizard who grew up in a family of financial wizards and wasn't allowed out of the house much and wants to make clean, nice movies that he won't be afraid to take his children to see makes. And not, not all the studio heads are that kind of man. Uh, some of them have quite different tastes. But, and so you begin to see which, which people will finance what and which will you know, go in which direction. But I don't know a single studio head who would have made The Black Stallion. There is not one who would have the respect for a perfectionist that, that Coppola did, who would give someone like Carol Ballard the time he needed and the extra money, and the confidence. I mean, that kind of chance taking absolutely does not exist at the major studio level. And there are reasons for it, if you think of it in bureaucratic terms. If a company makes a big international caper, and the budget runs away with it, and the picture costs 10 million more than, than it was supposed to, and the company loses money on it, the, the head of the company has still been playing the game the same way everybody else is playing it. He doesn't get thrown out by the heads of a conglomerate because he did what you're supposed to do. He filled it full of big stars. It has a crude, obvious story. But if he takes a chance on a picture, if he doesn't play the game the same way everybody else does, and if the picture loses money, then his head is on the block. And so you're penalized for just those qualities that would make for great movie making. Yes? Yeah, I was wondering um, about alternatives to the blandness of uh, big movie companies' movies. And I was wondering if you take into consideration, say, uh, alternative video sources and people having small video companies having access to cable and doing creative things that way. Well, you know, there it is. And I see, I see oh, two or three hundred. Uh, films and videotapes made by young filmmakers and experimentalists and underground people every year because various foundation uh, people call you because they have to make decisions on various people. And so I see tons of that. And often it's brilliant, it's marvelous, but uh, they are going to have to apply for another foundation grant next year and the year after and the next year because in most cases they are not making anything that people would pay money to go to see. And nor are they making anything that could really work on commercial television because they don't use actors and they don't know how to use actors. Kids in colleges who are interested in movies somehow don't recognize there's any relationship between movies and theater. They don't study anything in the theater department. They don't learn how to work with actors, and they generally don't care about that. It's generally the least talented who are interested in telling a story and working with actors. Well, I see marvelously imaginative cutting and image making by young filmmakers, but I don't know how they're ever going to make a living unless they teach. And of course, they're going to teach more people to make that kind of movie, <laughs> and the foundations are going to get swamped. And I don't know how you get beyond this. I mean, people hope that there might be a more segmented audience 
with the development of, of cassettes and, and more uh, television channels and cable and all. I'm not sure. So far as I can see, people will, you know, they want to hear a lot about a movie before they want to go see it. And they, they do tend to go, if only they didn't go to pictures like The Electric Horseman, if only pictures like that flopped, you see, then we'd get something else. But right now, the big stinkers are making money. And, I mean, that is the big drawback. If only the public said no. If only they did not respond to saturation advertising. If only they would give more of a chance uh, to the movies that attempt something. But how do you persuade people to do that? Yes? Uh, do you think the, the numbness that, that sets in from the sheer work of reviewing, which you were talking about, which is very understandable, has anything to do with your responding to real jumpy movies like um, The Eyes of Laura Mars and The Fury? And also, do you, do you, do you think that, that real uh, empty, clamorous movies like that have anything to do with inducing numbness in the audience? Well, you see, I don't think they're empty or clamorous. I think The Fury fails at, at the story level. Uh, to some degree, but there are such marvelous qualities in the movie making that I found it consistently exciting and frightening. I don't expect everybody else to agree with me, and I do point out when there are certain deficiencies in a movie. In the case of Laura Mars, the script is obviously nothing, but it is a marvelous piece of movie making with great humor and wonderful detail. I mean, where do you see a performance like that by Brad Dourif? Where do you see models treated with that kind of humor so they're innocent little dinglings and charming? I mean, that movie has wonderful embroidery. I mean, that is a great director taking a hollow, silly script and doing wonderful things with it. But I would, I might be more impressed by your argument if, say, people did not flock to really dumb thriller movies like Halloween where there's practically nothing going on. There's no characterization, no wit, nothing like the detail you get in Laura Mars. Now, I understand why people enjoy gross-outs like Dawn of the Dead. Uh, I, I think there are reasons why kids get so fed up with hearing about aesthetics and worthwhile movies and then stagger out of something as boring as hide in plain sight and why they begin to respect you know, crappy, gross-out movies. But when they start confusing that with movie art, that's when you get lost. I mean, I think George uh, Romero is sort of the, the horror movie equivalent of Russ Meyer. I mean, there's about as much art in both kinds of movie making. Well, there is a kind of dumb fun to, to the grossness. Uh, and I don't object to it. I don't mind it, I, you know. But what I do mind is the worthwhile movie. Don't you see? It's what I mind is everybody applauding Hyde in plain sight. It's the Rachel Rachel of this season. <laughs> you know, I mean, here is this movie uh, that people are supposed to respect because it's supposed to be about blue collar workers and how they really are. Well, it's a Hollywood director's idea of blue collar people. They have no talk. You know, if you go see uh, Preston Sturge's comedy, he understands that Americans never shut up. Uh, part of the difference between educated and uneducated people is that the educated ones are sometimes quiet. Uh, I'm, but you go to see Hyde in Plain Sight, and here is James Caan playing a worker like the man with the hoe. He is, you know, he, you know, he can't express anything but huh. And everybody in the movie is like that. Uh, his wife is just like Betsy Blair in Marty. She's another one of these totally dull, virtuous women. Uh, well, that kind of movie gets the raves, gets the appreciation. I mean, I don't expect everybody to like Laura Mars and to be, and to be really excited and, and pleasurably excited as I was, but I expect them to be honest enough to say, hide in plain sight is a drag. Yes? Well, I think we need you back on The New Yorker so that you'll uh, introduce some uh, decent movies to us. Well, you know, the terrible thing about New Yorker readers is they read me, but they don't go to what I tell them to. Uh, they are probably much more attuned to what Roger Angel is saying, because there is an element of, of cultivation and respectability. I think he's a wonderful writer, by the way, but I don't share his movie tastes. 
But I think there is a kind of middle class responsible taste, uh, which in a way, you know, is exactly what New Yorker readers want. I mean, they really want to hear about the latest fast bender and about the newest piece of art by Robert Bresson. I mean, you can't lure them to carry. Uh, they, I, I, I think in all these years that I've been there, no one, none of the writers or, people or editors has ever said to me, gee, I went to see that movie uh, you recommended last week and was it exciting? You know, the only people who do that are the messenger boys who live in the slums. Uh, and uh, when the editor on my recommendation went to see Saturday Night Fever, he was appalled. You know, they talk dirty. Uh, all the words we can't use in the magazine. Uh, Anyway, I, you know, I mean, it's true that I think people enjoy reading me, but they always, it, the, the most awful thing that I've ever heard there is one of the editors saying to me, uh, you know, when you pan something, you're really great, but when you recommend something, forget it. <laughs> that is enough to kill you as a writer. <laughs> ah. No, no, I'm not interested in screenwriting. I'm really, you know, I can say what I want to say in criticism. No, what I was interested in doing in Hollywood was recommending projects, stopping them from making some of the things they want to do. <laughs> I was successful on a couple of things, but I think maybe, you know, once you leave, they'll do that. Anyway, but I, and I did get them to put some writers on who I thought were very talented. I must say my experiences there were terrific. They did offer me a long-term contract. They have been marvelous to me. Now, this may be partly because they're a little afraid of me. They may think I'm planning to write about them. Uh, and so I was so amused. There were stories in the paper about, you know, terrible fights, which is what people love to think, you know, woman critic, she goes in there bossy and, and uh, you know, picks fights with everybody. There were no fights whatsoever. I had wonderful dealings, but I was always aware of the fact of their caution with me. And although I am not the kind of a writer who would go in somewhere under false pretenses and then write about it, I would never write about a situation unless I went in openly as a journalist covering it. They don't understand that ethical principle. And so I'm sure they were exceedingly cautious with me. And I never heard an unpleasant word from anybody. <laughs> yes? What do you think about the movie Forget Venice? I haven't seen it. Uh, I wasn't terribly drawn to it, but also I've been out in the country working on a book project, and so uh, I just haven't caught it yet. Yes? What about the movie Foxes? Have you seen that? No, I haven't caught that. And I must say, when, there, when I'm really excited about seeing something, I see it fast. And so when I realize, if I look in the paper, and there are a lot of movies like Little Darlings and Foxes and To Forget Ven. And I say, gee, I don't really need to go to a movie tonight. Uh, I mean, I'm saying something also, but I do catch up on them later. I think that the same people who used to complain about American movies being too bland and went to foreign films for excitement now go to foreign films for blandness and avoid American films because they're exciting. Yes, I'm sorry. Is there any economic basis for it if they can? I feel like the art couldn't afford to. Well, it isn't that it's difficult to import a movie. You can generally get it free on a percentage. It's that the advertising is so expensive. And when you consider that a picture, say, like The Conformist, only gave the company $100,000 profit, you, you see what you're up against. You can lose an incredible amount of money on the advertising. Don Rugoff, who finally lost control of his theaters, spent a great deal of money advertising foreign films and eventually was squeezed out of ownership of his theaters. Uh, I mean, an, a full-page ad in a paper may be $14,000. To, to make a movie register in the consciousness of the public and have it on a competitive basis with films that have an advertising budget of 10 million may break you if you're a small foreign distributor. I mean, you're the one who really needs the press. And a lot of the press will not give you that much space uh, or care. I mean, it can be more difficult to deal with, uh, with that kind of movie. And a lot of them won't bother. A lot of them don't have the ability to bother. 
and some of them have it and are too cynical to bother. Yes? I think that part of the problem with recent films is the generation that's begun to go to films that's basically been raised on television and might be more interested in a very slick image rather than um, a literate script I or I think that's part of it, but it's also that these generations were raised during the rating system, which has indeed kept legal censorship from hitting the whole industry, but it has prevented kids from going to movies, from going to the best movies generally, which are at least uh, GP or R. They don't go alone and talk about movies with other kids the way we used to. And so they have almost no basis for comparison. When they go to see Greece, it's the greatest thing they've ever seen. And they have no idea what, you know, what a great visual movie is, except they sometimes respond. I saw The Black Stallion in a theater in New York, a crowded theater in the afternoon, and I never saw one child go out for popcorn or a drink. And at the end, that audience sat in absolute silence during the end credits. So when they got the real thing, they did respond to it. On the other hand, by the time they're teenagers, uh, I mean, they're very likely to respond to the kind of schlocky movies that speak to teenagers' concerns. And if they haven't had that wonderful opportunity to develop aesthetic judgment on, on your own the way we had, I mean, because movies and pop music were ours, they were not like you know, music appreciation courses where we were taught the greatness of everything. We formed our own taste. Well, people don't do that with television because they go from one program to another and they simply keep watching. There is never an interval for discussion. So they don't talk about a show on the way to school or the way home. It all becomes a jumble. And I've heard, say, someone who had to leave before a television show was over ask another woman, say, on a city bus, how did it end? And the other woman who saw it has no idea because, it, you know, it's all this big block, television. Well, you, you don't form tastes or judgments that way. You barely have time to register great performances or, you know, I mean, I thought, for example, Alan Alda, who was a terrible movie actor but a great television actor, was absolutely superb as Carol Chessman. And he did difficult things that I don't think I've seen television actors do. I heard no discussion of it among people who had seen it. And even with something like Sybil, where uh, Sa uh, Sally Field was really good, infinitely better than she is as Norma Ray, there was very little discussion of it. And, and I think television simply does not promote aesthetic distinctions or taste forming. I think what it promotes is a kind of satiation and apathy. And, and that's very different. Yes? You know, that's one I haven't caught either, and, and uh, I will, I will, but something tells me. See, I am tired of women who go out to forge their destiny apart from men. I mean, you know, there are reasons maybe for, uh, you know, the sexes sticking together. Uh, and, and I can't conceive of how a woman, you know, goes out to become an artist by isolating herself from men. Uh, the women artists I know are, are generally very deeply involved with men. Uh, I mean, I will go to see the movie, but I have an instinctive feeling that it's popular for the wrong reasons. Yes? I'm always very much moved by Stanley Kubrick's films, and I, I feel that he's a great artist. Why do we see so little of this? Because he's incredibly compulsive. <laughs> And he shoots every image about a hundred times or more. I understand that the performers in his new movie were ready for the bug house. <laughs> I mean that the heroine had to do a crying jag over a hundred times. He wants every image to be perfect. Well, you know, he's working on a Stephen King novel. I mean, the whole fun of a horror movie is, you know, whipping it out, getting it done, and moving on to something else. He's been on this for years now, making sure every frame is perfect. Uh, maybe this partly comes from, from absenting yourself from your culture, from becoming an expatriate. You lose that contact with the rhythm of the life at home, and you become, you know, such a dedicated artist that you lose your horse sense. 
But, I mean, he lives in a guarded estate. Even the actors who worked with him for a year on this last picture weren't allowed into his home, which is protected by guard dogs. I mean, this is a very crazy way for an artist to live, and it explains some of, some of the movies also, because older directors who, who have made a lot of money tend to live in very protected ways. I think, it, I think it explains why so much of John Huston's later work was so uninteresting. He was living among the landed gentry, gentry in Ireland. Well, that's not how you keep the pulse of your culture that he had in, say, the Maltese Falcon, where the rhythm felt so perfectly American. It is, it is very difficult for older successful artists in fields where they make a lot of money uh, to keep contact with, with the vital material. And even though they had a lot of terrific ideas when they started, success insulates them and they start competing for the same dumb big bestseller projects. But, you know, I mean, Kubrick may come out with a wonderful film. What's a pity is it takes him so long and so much agony to produce what should be an entertaining thriller. Yes, sir? Um, what's your opinion of Paul Schrader? Well, I have pieces on both hardcore and, and uh, blue collar in this most recent collection. I think he has no instinct as a director. Uh, he, he is simply not a natural director. And there, there are people who are intelligent. He's enormously intelligent. He's very smart. He has terrific exploitable ideas and he sells them for a mint. But then he makes them in a sort of laborious Robert Bresson imitation. And he tries to give uh, religious spirituality to exactly the wrong themes. And his pictures have no life as movies. Uh, they're stagnant. Even in, in American Gigolo, where he's using Bertolucci's scene designer, uh, the, the, uh, the camera work, which moves constantly on the surfaces of, of the decor, seems logy and stagnant. And of course, it's probably a more interesting performance by Richard Gere than in his other movies, because in Days of Heaven and Blood Brothers, he's such a transparent imitation of, of Brando and Dean and Clift. But when you see him here, obviously Paul has directed him as another surface, the way Robert Bresson directs his actors not to show emotion. And when Gere does less, it's an improvement. Uh, but there is nothing to, to uh, draw you in. I mean, Lauren Hutton is just another Elizabeth Scott. You know, this, this made-up voice and this frozen face with this slightly pained mouth. There is nothing going on in those characters. And when he tries to give you one character to be lively, the Hector Eliz Elizondo uh, police detective, uh, he's got this wise, smart guy, but who in the story is wrong about everything. So nothing develops from his character. It's an attempt to be Dostoevsky and Robert Bresson when you really have no instinct for your medium. Yes? I just wanted you to comment on two related questions I have. Uh, one is, do you think that the American audience basically views the film in terms of it being American or a general category foreign? And also, do you think we can distinguish between the film on the basis of their national origin in any profound way? Well, I would say that most of us respond in a different way to movies that come from our own country. We understand them instinctively differently. Uh, and we're not as likely to intellectualize them. Now, there are artists who cross those boundaries. I think Kurosawa, because he was considered a very American director in Japan, made a much more direct contact than many Japanese directors with us, and because he staged action so powerfully. I think Bertrand Blier makes fairly close contact uh, with, with certain generations of Americans for similar reasons. I mean, if you saw his, his first big uh, film that was imported, Going Places, it was very American in a lot of ways. It dealt with juvenile delinquents, a very American subject. Uh, but there is no substitute for movies that speak to you in your own rhythm and in your own voice and about things that are going on in your life. And I think it's natural and right that you should react uh, to those movies more. 
And of course, you interpret them at a, at a more basic level. I mean, you really understand what's going on in American movies. And often, we misconstrue the nuances of, of, of foreign films. We really don't quite understand what certain things mean in their culture. That doesn't mean we can't appreciate the movies and respond to them at other levels. But there is an enjoyment of, of art that speaks from your own culture. And I don't think we should deny this. I think it's one of the things that educated people often do deny about American movies. Yes, in back. I wonder what, what kind of themes you'd like to see in movies now. What kind of what? Themes. Themes? Well, I mean, one can't legislate in the arts. What I would like is to see the themes that we are getting treated uh, maybe at a more abrasive level. I think our films are not dirty enough. There isn't enough raw abrasiveness when they deal with social issues. I think there is much too much timidity, much too much protecting people. And I mean, the great thing about movies is how powerfully we can respond. They're not giving us very much to respond to. You know, when you go see, say, Coal Miner's Daughter, People are really drawn into that first part because it does have a theme. It's about the feelings of family and community. But then it loses the theme. I mean, at the point at which Loretta Lynn breaks down and then has her convalescence, then we want to see the continuation of those themes. We want to see what has happened to her siblings, how different are their lives from her, how do they feel about her. We want to see what her relationship to her children is. And how do they feel about their mother having been cut off from her at such a vital time? We want to see what her relationship to Patsy Cline really was. Surely it couldn't have been that Patsy Cline just gave her that dumb black wig. <laughs> and, and what was her relationship to her husband as that developed? Instead, we're pieced off with silly things. I mean, career high spots and a nonsensical scene in which uh, she and her husband are putting up a house and they have a little argument about it. Sissy Spacek never gets a chance to grow in that role. I'm not sure she can mature in a role. I mean, I think she's wonderful at 13. She's preposterous in the later scene. She never suggests a grown, fully dimensioned woman. But maybe that's partly because the scenes weren't written to show us what happened to her. And that's the kind of thing, I mean, so often, I mean, the really difficult part of that story uh, we don't get. And, and I think that's what we're prepared for, that's what we want. And just, I think in almost every movie now, the themes are not pushed far enough, they're not developed enough. Uh, I mean, little silly endings are put on. I mean, you know, you go to see Coming Home, and there is Bruce Dern committing suicide. There is uh, being there, and, and Peter Sellers is walking into the water. Why? Because Hal Ashby lives at Malibu, I guess. I don't know why else. But the themes are not thought through. They're not pushed. There's no attempt uh, at not just a rigorousness, but being willing to be abrasive. Well, for business reasons, but also because very often, once the deal has been made on a movie, there is no producer on the set. The producer's names on the movies are just they are the financial end of it. There are very few working producers who will stand there every day, and when, when the script is being discarded or when it isn't developed adequately, uh, you know, to say, but, but wait a minute, we're losing the subject. We're losing our way. The directors are often coked half out of their minds. Uh, they are also men who like to improvise not within a structure, which is the great way to improvise. You know, say with Altman with Nashville, he has a great structure set, and he knows how to improvise within it. But directors get carried away. Something happened with their wife last night, or they had a new experience. They throw out the subject and throw in other stuff. I mean, if you look up the original script in New York, New York, it's a wonderful script, the one that Earl McRouch wrote. It's a terrific script, and you could have improvised a million ways within it because it had sound characters. Well, the script just was discarded somehow, and about all that's left is the character that Robert De Niro plays, and even that gets lost later on in the movie. Uh, you go to see Bound for Glory, and the director uh, had a terrific script, 
but he wanted to put in his personal political message. So he and his editor wrote new scenes, which totally bogged down the end of the picture. So you've got about 40 minutes of nonsense that pulls the movie down. And what was potentially a remarkable movie becomes this messy, diffuse thing. Well, I, I think you need some kind of creative tension on the set. I don't mean the kind of producers who just hire directors and bully them. I mean the kind of producers who keep a sense of what the vision needs to be on a movie, who keep the director's own vision in mind when the director loses it. And there have been producers like this. I mean, Mulligan and Pakula used to be a very good director-producer theme. Now most of the producers want to direct themselves. Uh, they don't want to do that kind of work on a picture because, of course, it isn't their work, it's somebody else's. And it's very tough work because it takes infinite tact, diplomacy, and bullying. And I think that's one of the things that's been lost in modern movie making. The director gets on the set, he has 150, 200 people who have never worked together before, who are assembled from various unions and from all over the world. Nobody knows what anybody else is good at. The tensions, the troubles are enormous. It's no wonder often that the directors get sick, they become a nervous wreck, they, they bomb themselves out because they just can't deal with all the problems of the movie making. They need clones. They need somebody who will keep in mind what they started out with instead of, you know, what happens to them often is they shoot key scenes so badly the scenes have to be thrown out afterward and the movie pieced together. Uh, very often their production schedule is unrealistic. They can't get the movie done that fast. They throw out scenes because there isn't time to shoot them. I mean, there are a million reasons why there is simply too much of a burden on the director now. And if the director has been the writer, uh, that burden is compounded infinitely because, say, like Schrader or like Coppola on Apocalypse Now, he loses track of what is poor in it. I mean, Schrader doesn't see that audiences are going to howl at some of those lines because he wrote them. Uh, you need another mind who's on a fairly equal basis with you often to work with you when you have all those business pressures. You need somebody to ease them. And that's what modern directors don't get. Let's just take, shall we say, two more? Yes. You've mentioned The Black Stallion a couple of times, and I agree, I thought it was a great movie, but I felt that its greatness rested on the first half, that the second half of the movie was guilty of many of the faults that you've credited to other movies that you've talked about. You have a, the cardboard character played by Terry Garr. You have Mickey Rudy going through this whole national velvet thing. You God, I thought he was wonderful, and I love Terry Garr. <laughs> but you've got the, the electric horseman theme, this horse running against... No, it isn't, if I may interrupt. It's not the electric horseman theme at all. I mean, this is a mythic horse running through a real city. Doesn't that do something for your imagination? And, and well, I don't think that Carol Ballard has a conventional dramatic sense. And there are a few scenes, such as the arrival of the old black man played by Clarence Muse, and a few scenes that are rather languorous. But I don't think most of us who react to the movie mind that. I think the sequence of that horse running through that town is one of the greatest sequences I've ever seen. And it is fascinating to have a movie told from the point of view of a child. That is to say, the world as seen through a child's eyes. I mean, we got that in Father Panchali. We almost never get that in the movies. The child's sense of discovery as he walked through rooms, even the child looking at his mother, uh, it seemed to me that the detail was superb in the latter half, and I was not disappointed. I think maybe the first part is a more conventional fairy tale, because you're aware that it's a fairy tale, because it's on the island, and it's a really enchanted landscape. But the marvelous thing is that that town is enchanted, too. And to see a movie divided that way, and yet keep that wonderful fairy tale quality and sustain it, I think it's the second half that's really more difficult and that takes more imagination. Because the sequences at the beginning are set pieces. And you know, they have qualities like White Mane and, and other fairy tale movies, and, and a little suggestion of the Sabu, uh, the Thief of Baghdad. But the second half, to perceive how through a child's eyes, 
Uh, your town itself is a magical landscape. That takes something. Yes? See, some of the New York critics, as well as people like Werner Herzog, have lavishly praised the little movie called Gates of Paradise, which made me wonder if I was <coughs> losing my, my marbles entirely. And I wonder if you've seen that when you think Gates of Paradise or Gates of Heaven? Pardon me? Oh, uh, Gates, of uh, Gates of Heaven, the one about the uh, cemetery. No, I haven't seen it. I, I have wanted to, but I haven't. Uh, Days of Heaven was bad enough. I hope that Gates of Heaven is better. Uh, let's see. Well, if you haven't asked a question before, let's take it, and then let's knock off. Yes? What did you think of Wiseman? I haven't seen that yet. That I do want to see, but I just haven't had an opportunity yet. Yes? Picnic at Hanging Rock, would you comment on that? I'd ra I have a piece on Peter Weir in this book, and although it's on his, his last wave, I think it would hold for this one, and so I'll, I'll pass on that. Yes? Hi, I'm Natalie Cooper. Yes. And I've written a movie, too. Go I've ahead. written a movie. Yes. And what, what is, is your movie called? It's called Ohio Shuffle. Has it opened? It's been optioned. Okay. But what I want to say is, yes. I have no one, and I've been down there and back, to emulate or to salute. But I keep your books near my bed <laughs> because I'm letting everyone listen into this. You, paradoxically, ironically enough, are my hero. <laughs> and I want to tell you that you're not going to burn out or rot in the job. <laughs> because in addition to your intelligence and your humor and your humanity, you're a very sexy writer. Ah. <laughs> I can't go on after that. <laughs> Listen, if you have any more questions, ask me privately. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you abstract me?